So our next speaker is uh, Horst Spielmann, and I just want to say I've known Horst for many years. Um, he's done marvelous work on the alternatives field uh, from his position as director of ZBIT in Germany. Um, and um, in, to paraphrase uh, uh, one of our current president, who said of uh, Ambassador Ivanovich that she was going to go through some issues, uh, well, Horst Spielmann has been through some health issues, so we are really delighted to see him here, bouncing around and giving yet another uh, interesting talk to us. So, Horst, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'm unfortunately, uh, I don't know, have some problems with uh, the guys in CL, uh, Microsoft people. I have some animation that doesn't work here. I hope I can give my talk. <clears throat> I don't blame Melinda, but maybe I'll. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, as you can see uh, right here, I, I'm, I'm on, on the left side, I'm with the Free University and I'm uh, President currently Secretary General of the European Society uh, for Alternatives to Animal Testing. And I, I say this because uh, I retired 12 years ago, 2007, and I'm only talking about what I did after that. Okay, basically, what, what happened after I retired in 2007. Uh, because in order to encourage others that there is life after uh, uh, life in the public service. So I was, uh, uh, as you can then, um, uh, okay, I'll see how this works. I'm going to uh, talk about the first center, the first government 3 r center in the world. I was in, from, started in 89. Then in 2007, I, the Free University offered me a professorship for regulatory toxicology. And I think I'm the first professor for regulatory toxicology. This because in the, in the years before, I had to try to get uh, tests that were developed in Europe or in Germany accepted around the world. And so I'm really, uh, I had to interact with the US regulators and with the Japanese and others. And that's why I am then a uh, professor for regulatory psychology. Uh, I just want to say a few words about uh, the EU, EU cosmetics testing. And then I think what is really important, there something had to happen after that. And it's, uh, Alan has stressed it, disease models. I think in, at the moment we have to work on disease models because cosmetics and toxicology is gone. And then there is the human and the chip technology I may forget I am chairman of the supervisory board of a human chip company. And I'm biased, I'm, I, I will tell you, I'm paid by them, and I see them very positive. Many others don't, but I think they develop the best technology that is currently available. And then I would allow me to say two words about dogs as a second species in chemicals and drug testing, uh, because I also did something there, and uh, in the end then, I'm very proud, and it's my last word, then uh, we are currently establishing a network of 3R centers um, in Europe. So this is my first slide, and this is in 2089, and you can see me, uh, I'm fairly young there, you see Spielmann, and uh, it was at the time the first government funded 3R centers. So CAT was older, but for whatever reason, Animal welfare had so much power in Germany that they had to establish this institution in the Federal Health Institute at the time. And the good news was I didn't get any staff. So I got my diploma. Now you're head of SEBE, uh, the German center. And, but, uh, but I got a, a little budget. I could fund research. And believe it or not, this is the most privilege, the best privilege I had. I could, if I heard something, for example, Thomas, and I said, I like what you do, and next year you get like 100,000 or whatever, I could give it to them. And you have friends everywhere, everybody likes you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. It is really a privilege. And there are some people who really remember that I helped them start. For example, Uwe Marx, who is chair of this chip technology. I was the first, he was in East Germany, I was the first to give him money and he never forgot. And even though I had this terrible disease, uh, he kept me as last year when I was in the hospital as chairperson of the supervisory board. So I think some people don't forget and are quite nice. Uh, now I come uh, to, the, to the real problems. Uh, what we had in the, uh, as you can see, the slide is from uh, Alan. Um, um, and it, it says that, that um, after I, I, I left my 
position, but also, also during the time, which means between 2000 and 2010, there was this major difference in approach on alternatives. In the US, TOX21, it was very new then, and in, uh, from top, uh, the, the top-down development, and in, in, in Europe, uh, the government wanted to support. So I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a little irritated because I say the next thing on the next slide. So I should have um, shown this first. Alan has shown this, I just put this slide on, because I think this is then really, in 2007, after I left, something new, because in Europe, now going back to the other one, in Europe, we had the, the, the point down here, the EU wanted to get rid of animal testing for cosmetics, and there was no good approach. And so I talked to Andy Rohn, and he said, and, and in addition, they put lots of money into this, which means funding. But when I was in, in Brussels and I said, who is coordina coordinating this? They said, we don't have anybody. So I talked to Andy and then the, um, his uh, colleague, Troy Seidel, he was very young then, said, why don't we set up a coordinating um, uh, project called Accelerate? And it, today you see this everywhere. At that time, it was the first I had ever seen, I mean, in Germany, no one could come up with the acronym Accelerate. It was from from uh, HSUS, uh, and so we set up then to, in order to get um, the, the tests that are developed in labs and in, uh, used in industry, um, you know, we, we, the idea was to get them through, as you can see, the individual methods through the EU and OCD, it, it, putting them into uh, these guidelines, and then in, in the EU we have programs, five-year programs, one is a framework program six and seven. This is the five, ten years during which this type of research has been funded. So basically, it was very important. There was a collaboration between, um, anyway, the Free University at the time. I was at the Free University. The Free University was happy, of course, that I brought in money uh, from from the European Commission. Everyone likes that, even if they don't like the research. So and that what I want, just what I want to show, uh, and I think it's important here. This project Accelerate basically was the coordination of all the projects that were funding projects to get rid of uh, animal uh, use in cosmetics testing. And so the idea is accelerating the transition to a toxicity pathway based paradigm for chemical safety assessment through in internationally coordinated research and technology development. So basically, through this project, I managed to influence in, in Europe that this US concept was accepted. But this was basically uh, through um, Andy Rohn and Humane Society. So we had uh, one, uh, every year we had workshops where everybody had to, to uh, report progress that they had made. So we had one, as you can see here, I think it's 2010. The next one is then 2011. The next one is 2012. And then in the end, in 2012, this is the situation where, how we were able to replace um, in the animal testing by non-animal tests. And as you can see, the, second, the green is the complete 2009 skin, phototox, percutaneous skin. And uh, some others as well, but the rest not. So only in a particular area we were able to replace. And now this is my nice slide, uh, next slide, and I think it's the most important one today, which you may not know, because it really shows many things. But it, it just shows the long road, I don't have a pointer, from 1993 for the first time the European Commission said we don't want animal testing. There was a long road and all kinds of projects and in the end, what, what's important here, <coughs> in the end, what's important here, in 2013, March 11, it was accepted. But the most important thing, and you should keep this in mind, you cannot do research without funding. So if you ask, if you want to replace drug testing for cosmetics. This little area, the commission put in 250 million and industry the same. So half a billion euro it has cost just to replace. And I think this is my major message now. And I was fortunate that I was allowed to coordinate. So, and then the, the thing that I liked then the most, of course, the, everybody likes success stories. So the success story is here. The commissioner, which is the minister for this area, on. Uh, March 11, 2013, full ban animal testing. That's what I reached after I was retired. So you can do things. There's two things that I put on, on purpose, of course. 
Other countries appreciated that. You can believe me, Japanese have done. And in the US, I still say I know it is not legally requirement. That's what I, why I put down NIH, and this is the abbreviation I like the most. It is not invented here, and I think this is my major problem with this country. Uh, and I, some people don't even laugh about this when I say this. <coughs> so this is the first part. <coughs> now I'm t switching to, to drugs, because this is over, and drugs is a much harder challenge. And I only can show you a few things. Uh, and uh, if it infectious diseases, you may, it may not, you may not, if you do, have not uh, worked in this area, it may not occur to you. But there's big differences between mice and humans. And I just show examples, for example, that we have a soft palate, the mouse doesn't. So if you want to study infections, that's my point now, in mice, you cannot get an infection with a fungus uh, candida. So uh, a guy in, uh, it's more than 10 years ago, Günter Weindl in the institute where I work, set up a, a, a skin model. I forgot one, one important thing, of course. Uh, I think this, uh, I, I, the success story, why did it happen with uh, cosmetics? It's the science, it's not animal welfare, it's the science, because we could produce artificial human skin and eye. I forgot this. This is the main reason. But we are not there yet with drugs in all organs. So for the organ, skin and eye, we had these model, human models. We don't have them in the other areas. I forgot this. I think this, uh, from the scientific point, this is very important. Anyway, you can set up a simple system where you infect with the fungus and put in uh, the polymorph. Uh, nu nucleosides, neutrophils on top. Anyway, it's easy to you, you make this model. They invade the, the bugs, the, the fungus, candida. They invade the, the epithelium. And then you can see and make um, the, the most important message here is the human polymorph uh, nucleosides are <coughs> inducing upregulation of expression of toll-like receptor 4 in human epithelial cells. That's the defense mechanism. This defense mechanism is absent in mice. So how can you, I mean, I just want to come up with some scientific arguments, not just we don't like this anymore, but it has to be science driven. Next one is then dopamine oxidation mediates mitochondrial and lysosome dysfunction in Parkinson's. I cannot uh, read this in exactly, but anyway, the message that comes through that I want to tell you is, again, if you have a dopamine system, Alterations in calcium homeostasis and dopamine metabolism contribute to intrinsic difference between human and mouse dopaminergic neurons. So if you look at it, and you have to believe me, uh, it is from science, so there, is, there are differences, <laughs> not only because we know, but that's the way it is. And I think my last one here is then from a colleague in Berlin. They use lung infection, and lung infections are really terrible, and uh, again, Mouse models don't work, so it's ex vivo human lung from surgery. And you, for example, here's the streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, and if you do the infection, then you get uh, cyclooxygenase 2 induction. And then this triggers, on, on the surface, triggers everything and the defense mechanism. So again, the mechanism that works in humans is very different from mice. This mechanism does not work in mice. OK, you have to read it. That's the way it is. And then in the end, of course, I need something from this country. There's uh, the Cl Critical Path Institute developed a holo, um, holo fiber uh, model for tuberculosis development. So there is ways of developing, and tuberculosis is the number one. It's uh, more important than, uh, more terrible than HIV at the moment. So having in vitro models developing this is a very important. So we have models, and you cannot use them uh, in uh, de de these developments in animals. So now is, I think, my, I want to switch to, to drug development. And I have some problems anyway with the slides and the animation. So basically, Alan has said something similar. In, on the left side, where it's green, if you have 10,000 substances, it's not me. VFA is the German Drug Developers Association. So it's the drug companies came up with this slide. So from basic messages from 10,000, 12% preclinically accessible, which means in, uh, in animals then going into phase one, phase two, one approval. So it's one out of 10,000, and the same is summarized here on the right side. Why do they fail? Lack of activity. It works in my mouse Alzheimer's model. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't work in humans who have Alzheimer's. That's the basic measure. And then adverse effects. So success rate in this preclinical, again, only 10%. So it's not me. This is published. So the, re the point now is, and it was better in my first slide, the reason now, drug industry decided we have to switch to human cells and tissues. We could do this for skin and eye. Now, I think we have to try to set up models for culturing human cells and tissues and develop disease models with human physiological based models and it's the human on a chip concept now and I think you are familiar with that. Um, is this the, the, the landscape here is from 2014 and as you can see the US government has invested 140 million. Um, uh, here it's DARPA, it's um, uh, NIH, they have given NIH and NCATS and DARPA have given lots of money and we have, at, at the time, this was 2014, in Germany, human chip program in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, and even in Russia. <coughs> Uwe Marx, who is chair of, uh, CEO of the tissues company, <laughs> lived in China and also in Russia for a while, and that's why we have connections to China and Russia. Now, uh, I don't want to go too much into detail, just a little historical thing. I mean, there was lots of, as you can see, lots of institutions have been involved, and uh, there's this U.S. tissue uh, chip program with um, MIT and Wies at Harvard, and you know they failed. Uh, I don't want to go into detail here, but that's the way it is. So in 2007, when it was started, uh, it was uh, in science and elsewhere, lots of um, publicity, and now when we look down, in 2019, where are we? This is gray, is academic discovery. Did they, did they ever make the, to, sub, to the supplier industry, to pharma and CROs, regulators, and to the patients? The negative thing is it, we never so far, and that's the way it still is. Uh, pharma and CRO and regulators and the pa patients, we have never reached that. I mean, you just, people may tell you whatever, but that's the way it is. And on the other hand, you can see here, there's lots of companies, organ and chip devices, advanced to market, lots of them. Uh, uh, this is from 2017. So there's an abundance of companies working in the area. Now coming to the company, uh, Tissues, with, with, I'm affiliated with that. And so the idea of Uwe Marx, who's CEO, is that organs are built up by multiple identical functional self reliant structural organoids. So, organoids are evolutionary conserved and subject to genetically encoded self-assembly. So, we have for absorption little mini, or if you go down, the smallest unit that is functioning is the is in the liver, in the kidney, and in the gut. Uh, we try to put this into little devices. Use them, not just cells. Okay, that's the basic idea. And now, the, my best slide doesn't work since uh, the Gates uh, family or whoever in Seattle doesn't <laughs> allow me to do it. No, don't laugh. <laughs> uh, so you see here, uh, the idea is then, uh, he, he has calculated, Uwe Marx, like 10, we need 10 liver lobuli. Anyway, that's what we are using. And it's the same, you can go through all organs for the bone marrow, for um, kidney, for lung, and so on. For all of them, he has determined a certain size that should be used, and they are used, and um, they, we are using a small chip. It's, it's as big as a slide, a, a, a general uh, objective slide that you use for pathology and anatomy, and unfortunately, again, it doesn't work here, this, which means there's this two circles here, two here, and both of them have just two organs, and the red point is there is a pump that allows them to, to, to uh, stimulate the circulation. And so we have a, the company has now, we have uh, changed the name. We have a control unit, usually a four of these two uh, organ chips, but we also have a three and four organ chip now. And the features are size of a standard microscope slide, on-chip micropump and enabling pulsative flow, suitable for primary and iPS-derived cells, 3D constructs, biopsies, cell lines, compatible with live tissue imaging, plug-in option for insert-based barrier models. And it's manufactured at the institution. And so this is then, as an example, an admin chip. 
and uh, it, it contains, as you can see, skin, liver, intestine, and kidney. And uh, again, you have these different parts of it, and you have, believe me, um, it, it works to, anyway to some extent. Glucose is in there, and it has been uh, critically reviewed. Now I'm changing to examples. For example, uh, disease models, this in 2017. This is the in vitro glucose tolerance test. I don't want to go into too much into detail, but I'm a medical doctor, so if you don't know if you have diabetes or not, the most simple essay is inject glucose. If you inject glucose, then the body reacts and the level goes up and down in your blood. And this simple system, and it's a <coughs> commercial uh, uh, pancreatic aisle from Insfero, and uh, the livers are from HEPRG cells from BioPredict. They are put in there, and you, you have to believe me, uh, glucose goes down and insulin is influenced, so it just works like the normal human, this simple system. And as you say, it was developed with AstraZeneca. One other point is we are working closely with industry and we are not allowed to publish. That's the negative thing about it. There's always, industry does not usually allow to publish, and we, but we can uh, discuss this um, because they developed for different industries, different ships. Then here is one for Biostorff, which is a German... Uh, Cosmetics company, and here uh, it is supposed to be a skin and liver, so you apply a cosmetic, in this case retinoic acid, either on the skin or to blood and liver, and as you can see, uh, the, the route matters. One of these metabolites you'll only see if you put it on the skin, this uh, uh, retinoic acid binding protein too. And it's similar then if you look at metabolism um, in, in the next one, uh, again, retinoic acid, and you see uh, glucuronidation, and if you look, put it on the skin, you can see all the metabolites that you want to see um, from uh, uh, retinoic acid. So the model works at least for simple, to answer simple questions. So to make a long story short, in co co cooperation with industry, tissues has developed several organ models, and as you can see there, the, some assays are, number one is basically the concept, number two, model um, established, number three, assay established in industry. So you can see from these, this is only the two um, organ models, liver, pancreas, diabetic testing, it, it, it is, they are, the three of them are in hair follicle and lung tumor is uh, established and used in industry. And the others are not that far, but so far, and I come back to one earlier one, so far, uh, the assays are used for decision-making, seven of them, but there's no drug yet developed and had not been submitted to any regulatory agency. And for example, I'll give you another example. Again, I can't go into detail, and I'm also have, uh, I don't know, had to, I'm not allowed to talk about this type of research. Anyway, there's a model used for human repeated dose hemopoietic lineage toxicity testing developed in cooperation with AstraZeneca, and believe it or not, uh, Roche and Bayer are using the same now. So, I mean, this has some promise. And uh, the good thing here is that this chip model um, is very robust. It doesn't only work at our labs, but it works in the other labs as well. And uh, even better news is, uh, and you may not be aware of that, it is established at the FDA. It is established at the, uh, in China. Uh, in Japan and even at the Russian agency. They all have this, and even uh, um, it will be used on a satellite by, uh, by, by NASA, uh, one, one of these. So I think the, the good thing here is that it's um, a, a fairly well-established system. Now I turn to two short points, and this is my uh, little hobby or not. Anyway, uh, the German <coughs> pesticides industry said, we don't want to do so much testing Doc, is drug testing necessary? And the public and animal welfare don't like drug testing. So when I was still at, uh, in the Federal Health Administration, I took the data, and that's why these data are so important. I took the data from my colleagues that have been used from pesticides for decision making. That's, you see, the first three publications are ours. It's basically not just use, looking at drugs, but drug, uh, pesticides that have been used for decision making, asking, which uh, endpoint, which concentration that you found in, in, in testing in dogs has then been used for decision making later on for, for safety of pesticides in food and elsewhere? And the number is 
for anyway, the one year study, zero. But it was not, nobody cared about it. Then the European Crop Protection, uh, 10 years later, 2014, picked this up and said, yes, we want to carry this forward. And I was uh, invited to the first uh, Asian Congress 2016 uh, and uh, presented this. And um, um, then the Canadians also uh, um, evaluated. And basically, it always comes, the only hard data is these three old studies that we did. And in the end, and I think it's really good you see, 10 years after I retired, the one year dog toxicity study is no longer required in the US, EU, Canada, Japan, and even Korea joined. So you can do things. It's not really alternatives, but I think that's the public likes. And this is now, uh, this is, has been carried on. I, I, I didn't even anticipate this. And I think this is the most promising step yet because the US drug company, Vanda, uh, spoke up and said, Wanda takes a stand against unnecessary animal research, Kanda uh, pursuing action against FDA for requiring unnecessary studies that will result in death of dozens of dogs. This was in February this year. Believe it or not, they contacted me while I was still very ill, and I'm basic, it's based on my studies. That's why the guy here, Michael, uh, he is from Greece, Polymeropolis, he's CEO, he did this. The shares went a little down, they are up again. And he uh, followed my invitation at our last Congress last month. He gave a major lecture on challenging FDA's requirement for long-term studies in dogs for the safety assessment of drugs and pharmaceuticals. I think this is something, and if you read his, uh, whatever he says, basically he asks other companies to join and he makes it quite clear that uh, others should also stand up. But for many reasons, I don't want to be idea. I just, you should follow this up and I think this is very, very encouraging today and you should also talk to him. So and the final one is then, as I told you, my first slide was I was head of the first government three hours institution. And all of a sudden, we have, as you can see, more than 30 three hours centers in Europe. Wonderful, but some of them are government, others are not. This is not my slide, you can see at the bottom, I can give it to you, it's from uh, David Smith from, uh, from Nori Kopa, um, from, from the Norwegian. And as you can see, there's many in Germany. So what about this, why is this? We have national centers and also ECWAM. They basically ignore that smaller units like universities in our, in our we, are, we have 16 states, like you have more states in, in Germany, every state now wants a little alternative center. Anyway, the Greens are powerful in Germany and so anyway, they want this. And universities, veterinary institutions have their own 3R center. They call themselves now not animal facility, 3R center working on refinement. So the idea is what they want to do is very different. Some are working on education, the priority, others on basic science, and uh, not all of them are working on replacement. And the ideas that come from ECWAM and the European Commission, they are never transferred to them. So I invited them last year to our Congress, Yosat Congress, why don't we have a meeting? And believe it or not, it was overwhelming. All of them want this all of a sudden, and this is uh, one of my last slides now. Um, no, not yet there yet. <laughs> So uh, what I want to say is we had a month ago uh, establishing an international 3 r centers network, um, Winfried Neuhaus, I'm 77, I want to retire, so he's taking over. And you can see there uh, Dagmar Hirofa from Czech Republic and Akawa from Bratislava, Kojima from Japan, Anne Lang from Germany, Adrian Smith from uh, Norway and Shoji Sabo from Budapest, all of them joined in this round table. And so this is the new development. I think this is the future. You should also take this into account. And I have to say, I don't want to be too negative here, but usually CAT is too arrogant to talk to us. I mean, CAT Europe as well, and ECWAM as well. They are all the, 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 some stupid veterinarian who starts a little three hours activity in a university in Germany. They just don't care about them. And they don't put them on their uh, information list. I mean, that's the way it is, unfortunately. So there is a future for three hours, and I'm really happy that this idea caught on. And as you have seen, my final slide then is also an important one. <coughs> I took this, as you can see, in 2002, Peter protesting, and my point down here is, I say thank you, without the support for, of NGOs, the three hours concept would not have been accepted by the scientific community around the world. I can tell you this is true, 
Max Planck in Germany is always defensive, animal welfare and this legislation takes the animals away. They are now very defensive and, and even a page, but it's not about alternatives, it's about understanding animal research. Why do we have to do primate research and things like that? So anyway, in general, this concept is accepted as positive and that's the end of my story. Thank you very much.